good uh, introduction. Um, it, it's lovely to be here. Uh, I, I often say that uh, in seminars, but I don't always mean it. But actually, <laughs> actually, I really, really do do mean it this time because it's it's really great to see some uh, uh, friendly faces uh, in the audience, uh, Chris and Heather and Cindy, uh, as well as uh, Kamalesh uh, Adhakiri, my former PhD student who submitted his PhD at RegNet in January and made the dream transition to a postdoc here at the University of Queensland. So it's really, it's really lovely to be here on many fronts. Um, let me just uh, provide a little bit of uh, context or background for this paper uh, this, in order to make a uh, sense of the specific topic. The, the paper itself represents uh, both the end of a project and the beginning of another one, and I'm sure that's a fairly familiar situation for many of you to be in. It's a bridge, as it were, from a project done to another project that has opened up. Um, the project, the finished part of the project, uh, is that the paper is the last chapter in a, in a large collection uh, written by Regnet scholars that tries to bring together the last decade and a half of Regnet's work. So Regnet stands for the Regulatory Institutions Network. It's, it's the place uh, at which I'm based. And it was established um, by uh, John and uh, Valerie Braithwaite uh, in the year 2000. And since then, it's been the um, centre, as it were, um, or one of the centres, I should say, uh, one of the centres of uh, regulation and governance studies, uh, both within Australia and, and more widely. But one of the things that we've never done as a group is to draw together our work. Um, and in particular, this has been a problem for our PhD students who have arrived and often asked the what is question. What is regulation? What is governance? And we generally uh, pointed them to a whole bunch of articles and so on, um, and in many ways, um, you know, there were other questions and other concepts that Regnet works with. Um, and uh, thanks, by the way, I have something to point with now. Um, there are there are other questions and concepts that we work with, like meta-regulation, for example. And um, and so the idea behind this book then is to draw together all of that writing. And what this paper represents then is the final chapter which I've, uh, which I've pulled together. And in a sense what I'm doing is free writing on, on the other 43 authors in the book, as it were, um, and trying to draw together all of the things that Regnet has to say about uh, regulation, both locally, regionally, as, as well as globally. So... The future of the project then is looking at what are the big issues that are going to be confronting capitalism for the rest of the century. It's not a piece of scenario building, it's not a piece of modelling, it's an attempt to conceptualise the governance issues or the regulatory issues. We don't see much distinction between those two things actually, for reasons that will become clear. Now, in order to make sense of what I'm about to say, we need to travel back a little bit in time uh, in order to understand the kind of take that the RegNet group has on, on regulation and governance. So let me begin with Hobbes, uh, because, of course, um, he's somewhat... An early member of RegNet. Yeah, an early member of RegNet. Uh, actually, he was, he was cast out. He was cast out because we, we converted to a Republican view of liberty. And, of course, Hobbes, Hobbes is our arch opponent, in a sense. But anyway, somewhere in the Leviathan, Hobbes says that law is not counsel but command. And he goes on to say, nor is it uh, the command of any, any man to one man, but rather, he says, it's essentially a command by um, that person to whom some obligation or duty is owed. So what is it that Hobbes does in the Leviathan that's so important to the regulatory story? 
is that he sets up a link between the state, the government, sovereignty, law as command and regulation. So regulation is seen as a subset or a subspecies of law. And that attitude, uh, or that argument rather, and combined with an attitude to law, is transmitted down through the centuries. So irrespective of which theorist you look at, this link between law and commands remains very robust and strong. And we see this, for example, in the work of John Austin, the 19th century legal scholar, whose work on uh, or developing a positivist theory of law exercised a huge influence on the Anglo-American jurisprudential tradition, that is to say, until the work of H.A.L.A. Hart, who became a professor of jurisprudence at Oxford. And what is it that Austin says about law? Well, he says that law is the command of the sovereign. So we see this persistent link, as it were, between um, law and command. Now, the important point is that when uh, lawyers talk about regulation, and indeed when other people from other disciplines were talking about regulation, they continued to think of regulation as, well, in its narrowest tech, technical meaning, as a species of delegated legislation, but in a slightly expanded version of the narrow version, essentially as a set of rules. Now, what happens um, uh, in the 20th century are a number of um, important, uh, important developments. First of all, we have the American realist tradition, which uh, is rooted uh, within, uh, within, the, within the United States, which under the influence of pragmatism begins to think about developing a scientific methodology for the understanding of law. So an entire law and society movement uh, essentially has its genesis uh, within the United States and begins to think about law as something to be studied scientifically, objectively, sociologically, if we think of the work of Roscoe Pound, for example. And out of that, there comes, and I'm crudely summarising now, an understanding that there is a gap, as it were, between what the rules say, what the law promises and what actually happens. There's a very famous article written by a law and society scholar called Mark Galanta, who it's, an, it's essentially and, uh, the title of is you know, why the haves always come out ahead of the have-nots, in which he essentially argues that the law, as it were, is structurally um, tilted um, to produce inequalities of various kinds. Now, what does all of this have to do with regulation. Well, as the law and society movement is beginning to reveal the shortcomings of law and the shortcomings of, of, of rules in operation, as it were, um, regulatory, uh, uh, um, more and more scholars are beginning to broaden their horizons and uh, begin to study uh, regulatory agencies and so on. So what we see is an emerging body of um, uh, regulatory scholarship, uh, mainly coming out of the United States where some of the very large administrative agencies have been, have been studied. We fast track to 1992 and Ian Ayres and John Braithwaite produce what turns out to be a landmark piece of work, which is Responsive Regulation, published in 1992 by Oxford University Press. And in it, uh, they articulate or, a, te or a, a, a theory of responsive regulation that treads, as it were, a middle path between two views of regulation. One is the very law, rule-centred view of regulation in which regulation is all about a set of preset rules with punishments attached to them designed to deter people from wrongdoing and produce compliance. And on the other hand, a view that capitalism or markets work best if they are not regulated, if they are free of rules. And that position had been essentially frozen uh, had, uh, by both sides. And so regulatory scholarship itself wasn't going anywhere. There was this continual tug of war, as it were, between these two positions. And what responsive regulation tries to do is to tread a middle path. 
Now, what responsive regulation is famous for is what's called the enforcement pyramid. So every PhD student at Regnet has the enforcement pyramid engraved on their chest. They have to be able to recite all its attributes at midnight. We used to sort of have a sort of Spanish Inquisition team that would wake them up as a test at midnight and if they if it actually caused the fall in student numbers. But the point is the point is that they had to know. They had to know the enforcement pyramid. And that is that is what people associate with with the, with the pyramid. But actually the more important message, the more important message of responsive regulation is not really, I mean, the enforcement pyramid is critical, but it's more what it says about um, the nature of regulation itself and the normative direction in which regulation ought to travel. And in particular, if you read Responsive Regulation, you'll find a chapter devoted to the idea of tripartism. So a very standard problem within regulatory scholarship is this idea of capture. So there are many gains of cooperation between a regulator uh, and a regulatee, a, a company, let's say a large company. There are many gains of cooperation, but the problem is as cooperation becomes too close, cooperation slides into corruption, and so you have these very well-known problems of, of, of regulatory capture. So what is it uh, that a responsive regulation says about how we should deal with that problem. Well, it introduces this idea of public interest groups, that we should involve public interest groups in regulation itself. So NGOs should have a seat at the table. Uh, the dealings of both the regulatory agency and the firm should be made transparent to them, and indeed NGOs should even be able to bring actions where the regulator fails to do so. So this idea of tripartism really... Um, sweeps through or informs a lot of the writing of responsive regulation. But what's implied in all of that is that the law is not enough. Right? The law is not enough to protect the interests of citizens. And what's really implicit and what became clear after responsive regulation is that not even civically minded citizens are enough this idea of associations of civically minded citizens being enough, as it were, to compensate for the failings of rules, that in itself is not enough either. What becomes clearer and clearer is that tripartism has to manifest itself as the organisation of networks. And that's really becomes critical. So that regulation has to be understood much more broadly than just being rules, and critically, there have to be organised networks that ultimately deliver what law fails to in many particular contexts. Now, importantly, tripartism is not a new idea. And you know, John would not be insulted, or Ian Ayres would not be insulted to hear me say that. Because in a way, what they... What, and much of what Regnet has done is really to synthesise the work of practitioners. And so, you know, where does the idea of tripartism come from? Well, think of Ralph Nader. Um, you know, Ralph Nader these days uh, gets an enormous amount of bad press because of the fact that he ran for president and may or may not, if it's not really clear, changed uh, the, the, course of, uh, the course of an election. But before Ralph Nader ran for president... He was a consumer advocate. And in particular, in the 1960s, he published an incredibly uh, important book called Unsafe at Any Speed. He was a, uh, a recent uh, law graduate, I think it was at Harvard University, who ended up in Washington. The American car industry was killing hundreds of thousands of uh, citizens every year. And the regulators were doing precious little about it car safety standards were dreadfully, dreadfully low. And if you actually read Unsafe at Any Speed, there's some very interesting tales by Nader of the sorts of things that impressed him as a consumer advocate. You know, he kind of relates the story of... And, and when you're confronted by large-scale problems, as you know, hundreds of thousands of deaths through car accidents, what tends to happen is you fasten on some event as a token of the bigger horrific scene. 
And what Nader relates there is a story about a young girl who was decapitated when, of course, there was no safety belt in the car, but the glove box lid fell down at the time of the accident. She hurtled forward and lost her head. And so he decided that something had to be done. That was what motivated unsafe at any speed. And, of course, it had a huge impact. Uh, it really changed the history of car regulation in the United States, and we all, all of us, drive better cars as a result of what Ralph Nader did. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that Ralph Nader inspired a very particular kind of organised network, Raiders, Naders. Um, that's to say teams of um, small teams that would target a particular area, get data, bring horrific consequences to the public's uh, attention, create uh, a kind of, uh, not a mass hysteria, but a mass concern about a particular issue. Public concern was mobilised. And that became an incredibly effective recipe for targeting not just the car industry in the United States, but airlines, financial organisations. There are all sorts of ways in which Ralph Nader improved through these particular networks. And it wasn't just that Raiders and Aiders operated in the United States. They operated, or the model, as it were, spread to many other uh, countries. The model was copied in many other countries. Now, what, is all, what were the implications for all of this, for, for regulation? Well, regulation ultimately emerges as the much bigger universe in which law is located. So the Hobbesian view, let's just call it the Hobbesian view for convenience sake, of where uh, law enjoys some sort of primary status, for a regulatory scholar it doesn't. It's just part of the toolkit, as it were. And the much more important universe to understand is the regulatory universe, which has many different levels. And importantly, as we see increasingly in the world, is a networked universe. And regulatory impulses can't come from anywhere in the network. If the state fails to act, other non-state actors um, can act. OK, so that's by way of background. And now I come to... Uh, this particular question, capitalism's processes of destruction, is, is, regulation, is regulation the answer? Um, um, so let me begin by uh, saying something about the rise of regulatory capitalism. Uh, what, what, do I, what do I mean by regulatory capitalism? Well, in part, I've already sketched that answer, and that, this is the idea that capitalism itself evolves into highly networked forms of organisation that are enabled particularly by information technology. So this is the idea that Manuel Castells writes a lot about, which is that information technology enables networks to achieve all sorts of coordination possibilities and resilience possibilities that older style networks were unable to do so. So an obvious example of this is the globalisation of supply chains, for example. So we know now that, uh, uh, well, let's take an example, a, 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 a bit of information technology, say an Apple phone or something, the research and development of that might be done in a United States laboratory somewhere, um, and then parts of that that will eventually go to make up that iPhone might come from Malaysia, some other bits might come from Taiwan, there'll be some software from Japan. Uh, so little bits and pieces will uh, ultimately all head over to a factory somewhere in China. What enables that mode of production? Well, it's information technology. These global supply chains would not have been possible without Without, without, information, uh, without information technology. And IT itself, I think Pastels is completely right in this, is essentially accelerating and creating all sorts of uh, dynamics which we're only sort of really partly and, and or beginning to understand. Now, um, the, 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 what regulatory scholarship... Uh, began to focus on was this idea of the regulatory 
the rise of the regulatory state. And so the question is, when did the regulatory state come into being and how is it different to other kinds of states or other kinds of capitalism? Well, oddly enough, most regulatory scholars think that Reagan was really... In America, it really begins with Reagan. Now, when you make that claim, people say, well, no, no, Reagan was the arch-deregulationist. But actually, if that were true, then you would expect that when you studied various administrative agencies within the United States, what you would expect would be you'd expect lower incarceration rates, say, for example, related to environmental crime, or you might expect financial deregulation of various kinds, you might expect tax offenders to get an easy run, etc., etc., etc. So what regulatory scholars did was to look at the Reagan era, and indeed, in the beginning, in the first term of the Reagan presidency, they did find that in some areas, for example, the Environmental Protection Agency, there seemed to be some sort of lessening of regulation. But by the end of the second term, what they actually found was that using indicators like incarceration rates, number of tax offenders sent to prison, the way in which financial regulation was treated, the Reagan era was actually the era in which people, for the first time, were being locked up for insider trading, etc., etc. Admittedly, we had the savings and loans scandal, which was a product of deregulation in the 1980s in the Reagan era, but then the Reagan administration responded by more regulation. So by the time you get to the end of the Reagan era, the number of administrative agencies and the level of their regulatory activity has dramatically increased. So regulatory scholars do not look at the Reagan era as an era of deregulation, but indeed as the beginning of the rise of the regulatory state. And the same argument applies to Thatcher, to the Thatcher, to the Thatcher years. And essentially what happens here is that even though these governments launched privatisation initiatives, those privatisation initiatives ultimately led to a rise in the number of regulatory agencies. So if you privatise water, or you privatise the hospitals, or you privatise telecommunications, or you privatise the railways, whatever it is, ultimately what you actually need is some sort of regulatory agency. And two political scientists, David Levy Four and Giordana, did a huge study of this. And they found not only was there a rise in the number of regulatory agencies within the United States and within Europe, but it was a global phenomenon. By the time you get to the 1990s, there is this enormous rise in the number of regulatory agencies. So we get to regulatory capitalism. And one question is, what is distinctive about this kind of capitalism compared to all the other sorts of capitalism? Maybe this will work a bit better. So there are lots of different types of capitalism. It's almost a game, China, and this is not an exclusive list by any means. This is simply an example. So people talk about capitalism as a territorial phenomenon. American capitalism, for example, Galbraith, the concept of countervailing power. We have capitalism with Chinese characteristics. And then there are lots of other types of capitalism, oligarchic capitalism, state-guided capitalism, big firm, entrepreneurial, and so on. And then there's a whole basket of capitalisms related to trying to identify how the means of production changes, so knowledge capitalism, information capitalism, post-industrial, and so on. And in particular, this type of capitalism is identified with the work of Maclup, an economist who really was the first one, back in 1962, to really understand that a significant number of people within capitalism were now being employed through the processing of information, providing services. And this was a profound shift from industrial capitalism. Now, the one thing that perhaps unites all of these different types of capitalism is this nice quote from Schumpeter. This is the idea that capitalism is by nature a form of method of economic change that not only never is, but never can be stationary. And this is 
comes out of capitalism, socialism, and uh, democracy. Um, what's, what's important about Schumpeter's observation, I think, is that it suggests that the idea of regulatory capitalism just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. Because, because regulation, in terms of applying rules of constraining liberty, is the very thing that capitalism um, w w constrains capitalism. Right, so it's, it's this idea that, that you capitalism flourishes because it changes. Right? This nice idea of Schumpeter's that gales of de, uh, creative, dis, uh, creative destruction come along. So um, how does this square with the idea of, of regulatory capitalism? Well, I think in part the answer has to do um, with the idea that regulation actually improves the adaptiveness of capitalism. So here is a, here is a definition. After all the, um, uh, the analysis of different parts of, of, of capitalism, both Braithwaite and Levy for... Um, come up with slightly different definitions of regulatory capitalism, but essentially it's this. It's a system capable of generating regulation from many actors at different levels using a variety of instruments to communicate their chosen norms. So in other words, regulation is not something that the state does. Right? Or, it, sorry, correction. It's not something that the state does exclusively. So this idea that the state commands and regulates through law, that's only one, as it were, type of regulation. What regulatory capitalism recognises is that there's a network out there made up of many different sub-networks connected in various ways through IT or through other forms of connection and that if the government doesn't regulate, another actor may well regulate. So think, for example, of an industry like the textiles industry where governments around the world have done a very poor job of regulating worker safety in factories that make cheap clothes that we all then pay a lot of money for in uh, various stores on which, we, you know, which they put nice trademarks and which we then pay a lot of money for. The workers that produce those, those clothes we know um, suffer from terrible working conditions and uh, are paid extremely poorly. And governments systematically around the world have done very little about that. And yet, um, there was a report released this week which showed, for example, that uh, the lot of workers in Bangladesh has actually improved over the last few years. And what has resulted in that, what has produced that regulatory initiative? Well, the answer is that many NGOs have been focused on these poor conditions for, for workers and have um, instituted things like the Fair Wear campaign, so a sort of counter, as it were, information strategy. So along with the trademark, you might see a Fair Wear label, for example, on a relevant bit of clothing. Um, similarly... Um, other states have tried to do things. So the United States, through its free trade agreements, for example, tries to raise labour standards within, uh, particular, uh, within particular countries. Unions have been incredibly important in these uh, campaigns. So what we see is that initiatives come from other parts of the network, as it were, to compensate for situations where a particular state is not acting. And that's true in almost any area of regulation that you can think of. That, that the broader picture here is of a web of regulation in which many actors are playing a role. And that it's a mistake to try and analyse a regulatory problem just by focusing on what it is that the state can do using law. That might be part of a solution, even then it might be. It's not clear that it always will be. But it's certainly never the whole story and you miss a much more complicated picture. So, um, regulatory capitalism then um, arguably is 
a superior adaptive type of capitalism compared to industrial capitalism, compared to the kind of capitalism that Marx identified, of of terrible working conditions, of, of deep instability, of deep inequality, that when we look at regulatory capitalism, we see it as a fairly evolved system that can produce regulatory impulses to counter or deal with particular problems in the system. So regulation becomes a sort of co-complementarity to the acquisitive nature of capitalism, to its sort of commodification impulse. There's a regulatory impulse which steers it down a better path than without regulation. And that is the argument of many of the people who have contributed to this book that I talked about. Now, I can take you through particular areas of regulation sector by sector and we can discuss how regulation has improved the lot of workers, the lot of women, the lot of Indigenous people. Think about the position of Indigenous people, the dramatic improvements over the last 100 years. One can think of many, um, many situations of where it's improved. And so one is tempted to say regulatory capitalism is more adaptive it's, it, it's, it's going to survive in the long run. What I'm trying to do in this paper is not to think about capitalism on a sector-by-sector sector basis, but rather think about capitalism in terms of confronting three very large macro processes. Three very large macro processes. And I'm going to call those macro processes... Um, Eco-processes collapse, techno-processes of collapse and financial processes of collapse. So I'll begin with um, eco-processes. In the case of eco-processes, the really important um, work that I want to draw attention to is the Club of Rome's report in 1972 called The Limits to Growth. Now, this was a really interesting piece of world systems modelling. What the Club of Rome did in that report was to look at five variables. They looked at world population growth, um, they looked at industrialisation, they looked at pollution, They looked at food production and they looked at resources depletion. So five variables. And they essentially built a series of models using some very simple computers. Everyone has more computing power on their phone than these guys had back in 1972. And they came up with a number of scenarios and every single scenario predicted the collapse of the system sometime before 2100. So on every single scenario that they ran. Now the report was much poo-pooed by the economics profession in the 1990s and then it sort of fell into, into obscurity. Not many people, or many, most people have actually forgotten about the Club of Rome report in the 1972 report. Except there's this uh, guy at uh, CSIRO, you know, the organisation, CSIRO, the organisation soon to be privatised, um, <laughs> Um, who called Graham Turner, who's a modeller, who kind of adopted the same approach. And what he has done is to take the last... Uh, he t- he's taken 30 years of data from 1970 to um, 2000... That's a little bit over... Somewhere around 2002, something like that. That's a little bit over two, 30 years' worth of data. And what he's done is rerun the... Um, Club of Rome's scenarios using this data, seeing whether it's robust. Now, actually, most of the scenarios turn out not to be consistent with the last 30 years' worth of data, except for one, and that's the business-as-usual model. So, in the business-as-usual model, this was what the Club of Rome referred to as its standard run, but we can think of it as the... the, um, Uh, as the business as usual model. What happens in that particular report is you get exponential growth in terms of world population, food production and industrialisation. And then because of the feedback effects 
in terms of resource depletion, non-renewable resources continue to deplete because of the sorts of feedbacks they identify and particularly the exponential feedbacks, the system collapses. So what Turner argues in his publication, he published this work in 2008, what Turner argues in his publication is that we are on track to, at least in the last 30 years, we've been on track in terms of the, the standard run scenario. Now we have a lot more work since then the International Panel, uh, inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for example, um, which uh, is making various predictions about the year 2000 or what will happen by 2100. And we also have the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment exercise, which was involved, which was a UN exercise, which involved more than a thousand scientists. It doesn't get much publicity. I don't know why. It was done around 2001, 2002, and it looked at. Uh, 24, the, the world has 24 major ecosystems and that report, it's published in a number of volumes, it concludes that 15 out of 24 ecosystems in the world, major ecosystems, are in dire trouble. So, the first thing that capitalism has to deal with then is the danger of eco-processes collapse. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to characterise these processes as non-linear they involve feedback loops and critically exponential growth patterns. Right? The idea of exponential growth patterns is absolutely fundamental to understanding the governance challenge because that's what you're dealing with. So what we've got is regulatory capitalism with its highly humming, networked, adaptive set of systems up against eco-processes that have exponential feedback patterns. So that's the first kind of challenge. I've only got five minutes. Okay. Techno processes of collapse. Techno processes of collapse essentially, uh, well, we know about those uh, when uh, the United States exploded two atom bombs. So the idea of techno processes of collapse or techno uh, extinction um, really begins, I think, with the nuclear period. Um, now, after the uh, nuclear bombs were, um, were exploded, uh, a group of scientists formed the Atomic uh, Scientists in Chicago group and they devised a clock. Uh, and they set the clock, I think it was at six or seven minutes to midnight, and every year they adjust the clock according to um, what they think the danger of it, you know, how many minutes we've got left to save ourselves from extinction. Nuclear war, of course, was the one that they were mainly concerned with. But in the last decade, the Society, the Society of Atomic Scientists, have added climate change to the clock and they've added uh, essentially a biological threat, so a pandemic of some kind. Now, I, I haven't checked where the clock is set recently, but uh, the last time I looked, it was uh, five minutes to midnight. So the idea here is that technological innovation creates different kinds of extinction threats. And a very good example of a recent one, which you may may have heard of, is uh, artificial intelligence. So a thousand scientists uh, a while ago signed a letter saying that artificial intelligence poses potential extinction threats of the order of nuclear war and so on. So how do we characterise techno processes of collapse? Well, we can say essentially that techno processes of collapse are a form of innovation. Nuclear bombs are a form of innovation. Artificial intelligence is a form of innovation. Carbon technology, whether you like it or not, is a form of innovation. And so then that raises the question of how we characterise innovation. And in the paper, what I argue or I draw on evolutionary models of innovation. And these evolutionary models of innovation are associated with a lot of influential economists, people like Richard Nelson and so on. So, in other words, where technology goes is not something that's exogenous, it's endogenous and it's affected by institutions. Where nuclear technology goes is affected by the military-industrial complex, for example, or indeed in the civil sector by uh, large firms, uh, large nuclear power operators. Finally, financial processes of collapse. That is, of course, what Marx was predominantly concerned with. He had very little idea about either eco-processes of collapse or techno-processes of collapse. Financial processes of collapse. 
Um, financial processes of the collapse have been around... Well, if you go back over the last 20th century, there isn't a single decade in which the system is not in crisis mm -hmm. of some kind or another. It's just true. Some countries appear a bit more regularly than others. Argentina pretty much, certainly after the Second World War, almost every decade. The point that I want to make is that how do we characterise financial systems as a collapse? Marx's idea of a dialectic is crude. It doesn't really get us anywhere. It's not a model of any kind. So essentially what I do in the paper is to draw on the work, the more recent work of economists, people like Minsky, the financial instability hypothesis. And what I say is that, again, we're dealing with a non-linear dynamic in which we have a degree of systems chaos. And I'll, I'm going to run a bit over time, but, but just indulge me. Um, so... The important point I'm trying to make by introducing this element of systems chaos is that while the system has these wild fluctuations, it hasn't randomised, right? It hasn't, it hasn't collapsed. That's very, very important. Okay, so we have these three systems, and then now I'm going to ask, how does regulatory capitalism cope with each of these three systems? Is it sufficiently adaptive at this bigger macro level? See, I'm not interested now in the question of does um, regulatory capitalism do a better job for poor textile workers in Bangladesh? The answer is yes, it does. I'm not interested in the question of whether it can fix up a polluted river somewhere in Australia. Chances are that it can. I'm interested in the much bigger question of and the question that the Club of Rome was interested in, is it, are we still in the danger of, of eco-processes collapse, or is regulatory capitalism a superior type of capitalism or code bridges? Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to say is speculative, right? I'm not trying to forecast. I'm simply offering a conceptualisation based on past performance. <laughs> Okay, there's one rider to this. All systems of capitalism have one thing in common. Every type of capitalism is a system of commodity production, right? It relies on a process of converting use values into exchange values. So a use value, a mangrove, for example, has a use value. The use value of a mangrove in America, for example, is that it helps to mitigate hurricanes. And that's probably worth two or three billion dollars a year for the US economy. But no one can turn that into a market. Right? Capitalism can only expand as a system if it takes a use value and turns it into a commodity that we can exchange, create a market in it. And so that's why people like Goldman Sachs and so on are very much interested in looking at environmental services, ecosystem services and all that sort of thing. Now, the point I make in the paper is that all forms of capitalism have what I call a commodification weight or bias. So when capitalism looks for a solution to a problem, it tends to land on a commodity solution rather than a public good solution or a commons solution. So you can think of a commons, an intellectual commons or a physical commons, as an alternative to a commodity solution. And what I'm saying is that capitalism, even regulatory capitalism, is tilted in the direction of commodification. And I think that's a reasonably uh, plausible claim. Okay, so let's deal with techno-collapse and regulatory capitalism. In order for regulatory capitalism to work to avert techno-collapse, you need lots of warning nodes in the system. So imagine a huge network... What is critically important to the optimal approach to surviving is that people have to sound the warning bells. Now, think back to biotechnology. Biotechnology got off the ground commercially in the, in the 1970s when we discovered uh, how to splice and dice DNA. Now, the scientists that were involved in that particular exercise sounded the warning bells, right? These were guys at Stanford. They were going to basically put some cancer cells into some bacteria, and everyone thought, well, this could be risky, you know, what might happen? So let's have a conference. It was called a cinema. It was in 1975. All the leading geneticists of the time came together, and what they decided was 
we had to have some form of self-regulation. And that has since evolved into um, much more complex forms of regulation for a recombinant DNA. The case of nuclear power. I'm sure everybody in this room will have different views about the success or not success of the non-proliferation regime, and likewise will have different views about the success or non-success of, of civil, the civil use of nuclear power. I think that both the non-proliferation regime and the, uh, the civil regime are examples of successes. If you look at Joe Rees' work, we have, uh, you know, in civil nuclear power situations, we have much less... We have many fewer problems with safety than we had in the 1990s and than we did in the 1980s. And, of course, that's as a result of things like Three Mile Island and so on. So a combination of crisis, social movements and so on have, have lifted standards. And no CEO of a nuclear power company is going to advocate deregulation. Right? No one's going to go on TV and say, hey, deregulate this industry. Rather, the industry recognises that a race to the top is the best thing. So we have a very strong safety culture in nuclear power. Non-proliferation, well, if you go back to Kennedy, Kennedy predicted that there would be 15 to 20 nuclear power states by, by 1970. That was his prediction. He made that prediction back in the early 1960s. We have nine. So I think that non-proliferation is an example of a success story, but people will differ. Okay, what are the effects of propertization? Remember, so I think we... Techno processes of collapse rely first of all on warning nodes and then, as we know, implementing certain cultures of safety. And I think capitalism can probably deal with these things, but very importantly, it's the effect of propertization that's extremely interesting here. Now, Paul Berg, who was one of the... Uh, Paul Berg is a Nobel Prize winner in medicine. He was one of the organisers of the cinema. And in 2008, he published a paper saying many scientists now work for private companies where commercial considerations are paramount. And the point he makes in that paper, which was published in Nature, is that it's much harder to organise an asylumar now because too many scientists have vested interests in the commercialisation of technology. Now, you might say to me, oh, surely some scientists will sound the warning bell. But my point, my reply is that what you need is a screeching flock. You need lots and lots of scientists. And the problem is, my fear is that too many scientists have been taken out of the game because of conflicting commercial interests. So commodification does, I think, present some sort of problem for capitalism when it's dealing with scenarios of techno-collapse. Financial processes of collapse... Here's a list, and this is not extensive. The system is in more or less constant crisis. The Great Depression, the OPEC inflation shock, the debt crisis of the 1980s, the Asian crisis of 1997, the Russian ruble crisis. I haven't listed. I could give you a long list of banking crises going back to the Hirschstadt Bank in the 1970s, Bearings in 1995, BCCI in 1991. It just goes on and on and on. What is interesting to me, and what I argue in the paper, is that um, capitalism has proved remarkably resilient in dealing with financial crises and collapse. Now, having said that, I'm going to go back to my hotel and I'll, I'll see that the, the share market's collapsed. That always happens when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've cursed everybody's, I've cursed everybody's supernatural. <laughs> but. The point I'm trying to make is that empirically, the system is not randomised. Why is that? Why is that? Well, the system is only semi-chaotic, right? It's not fully chaotic, but that's a question-begging answer. The answer, I think, lies in two things. First of all, the creation of independent nodes in the system. The most important the most single important independent node has been the central bank. It's been the independence of central banking. So over a period of a century, it is central banks that have their hand on the tiller of the system and not politicians. And that single important regulatory achievement is a huge, huge factor in why the system hasn't randomised. Because central banks don't prevent crises, but they manage them and they stabilise them. That's the point I'm trying to make. More importantly, more nodes are coming into the system. So what we see in the financial system is nodal integration. If you look at the Bank of International Settlements, which is where all the uh, central bank governors of the world meet in Basel, 
All developing countries are now part of the Bank of International Settlements. Similarly, the Basel Committee on Capital Adequacy Standards, every single major developing country is now a member of that committee, right? And they sit around the table chewing the cut over things like capital adequacy standards. And importantly, more nodes are being added to the system. Think of what China has done you know, over the last couple of years. The New Development Bank, right? an important source of multilateral funding. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, another very important source of multilateral lending. These are new nodes within the system. Now, China has moved on this because it's got these sovereign capacity, as it were, but the ideas for these things have been around for a long time. During the Asian financial crisis, Japan argued for a regional IMF, and that was an idea that had no support from the United States, and China essentially did not back Japan, and so the idea never went anywhere. But it's interesting now that we see China essentially forging ahead with ideas that were developed by Japanese Treasury officials. So my argument here is essentially that regulatory capitalism is, touch wood, proving remarkably resilient when it comes to managing financial crises. Ecosystems collapse. Here I really don't know. Um, the problem is you're up against the exponential function, and that is what the science, scientists continually warn about, right? That policymakers continually underestimate the strength of the exponential function. So when systems tip, they tip fast and suddenly. And um, and the problem here is that it's not clear to me whether profitisation is a strength or a weakness of regulatory capitalism. You can think of it as a strength if you think of financial innovation as driving renewable energy. So one of the really, really important things that's happening is we have a divestment movement which is creating... Um, or which is seeing capital being freed up, but it has to have a home, it has to go somewhere, it has to go into new areas... It needs new kinds of financing instruments. So things like green bonds, tax equity, uh, financing, securitisation, all of those tools of financial capitalism are important. So that's a strength of the system. So perhaps we, as it were, can create these new industries in time. But then I am pessimistic because at the same time, profitisation entrenches industries. I mean... If you look at the oil and gas industry, in the United States in particular, they are an example of an innovation success. Whatever else you think of fracking, fracking is an extraordinary story of innovation. It's given energy security to the United States. The United States, for the first time in 30 or 40 years, is going to be exporting oil, right? And it's, it's already exporting gas. That, that, if you think back to the OPEC oil crisis, that, that's beyond belief. And that is all down to innovation. And it's all driven by a property rights scheme that entrenches those industries. So, again, it's capitalism landing on a commodity-style, uh, commodity-type solution. And that means that it's going to be harder for governments to manage those industries out of existence. The science says we need to manage fossil fuel out of existence in the next couple of decades. That's going to be a tough thing. And this is where Schumpeter's metaphor of creative gales of destruction is weak, right? Because it, it, if you think about the metaphor, it's as if a wind blows in and all the industries are swept away and new ones take their place. That's not how it is. Actually, industries linger on. They're a drag. Think of the tobacco industry. We haven't been able to manage that out of existence. So, in ecosystems collapse, in that part of the paper, I, I just say I really don't know. You know the reader, reader can everyone will have a different view of, of, of this. One can see both strengths and weaknesses. But I do think that these are the three big challenges confronting capitalism for the rest of the century. This ecosystem's collapse with its exponential feedback functions, financial processes collapse and techno. These are the things that we are all going to be struggling with. In the <laughs>